All right, I'm here with Timothy Denevi. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so you wrote, you've written a couple books, uh, Hyper, as well as uh, this more recent book, Free Kingdom, uh, Hunter S. Thompson's Manic Tenure Crusade Against American Fascism. Um, there have been a lot of books about this guy, understandably. He's a fascinating character. This book in particular concentrates on what may be the most prolific and from a literary standpoint, consequential period of his life from 63 to 74. Um, why did you want to write this book? You know, that's a good question. I really enjoyed um, coming to his political writing when I was in my 20s. I'd read some of his other writing before, but I was especially struck by an essay of his about the murder of a journalist in Los Angeles, um, an essay called Strange Rumblings in Ozatlan. And, you know, I, I, I feel that even though he portrays himself as kind of a caricature on the page, even though he creates a persona, who's the Hunter Thompson in the moment, going through these um, different um, interactions, I began to see with that essay for the first time, and this was again, you know, two decades ago when I was reading him, um, I began to see that he was such a serious um, and um, gritty journalist, you know, who was a professional and had worked in that field and learned its ins and outs. And so often I see that writers, I see writers who arrive at, I'm sorry, I, so often I see today writers who kind of begin in his more personal style. Yes. But I, I began to understand that he had written articles according to style sheets. He had played the game and done what was asked of him, the who, what, when, where, why journalism before he eventually began to branch out and experiment with his own style. Um, and that was fascinating to me. So then when the, by the mid 2010s, um, I had been doing my own uh, creative writing and um, political essays um, that I, 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 in which I tried to blend personal and more hybrid forms, um, taking more from the tradition of the essay. And um, it felt to me as if his perspective um, had remained um, as relevant as ever. And it was a nice way to look at how I was trying to understand um, the political reality of 2015, 2016, 2017. And so um, that's when I wrote, um, 2017 was when I wrote much of the book. And, you know, I, um, I was really, um, I was heartened to see how serious, when I went to go do the research, how serious a thinker, not just about journalistic issues, but about issues of how a democracy works and how it begins to fail and what we can do to hold power accountable, how important those issues were. Um, to him. And so it was kind of a nice way to deal with, I think, the general volume level and anxiety hmm. of the um, past administration, um, presidential administration, and just how current politics have become um, yeah. by returning to this kind of tenure stretch that spanned, um, you know, a Democratic and Republican president, um, you know, began with the transition of power between John F. Kennedy and LBJ, uh, the book, Creek Kingdom, and then it ends um, with Nixon's uh, helicopter leaving the White House lawn. And so I'd never really thought of it before as being so demarcated by presidential administrations because we kind of forget that a, a new administration comes into being when there's an assassination like Kennedy's, but, um, or that a new one comes into being both, un, you know, they're both unnatural uh, successions. One is Johnson's taking over for Kennedy after the murder, and one is Nixon leaving and Gerald Ford taking over after resignation. So that's such a strange time in American history, I think, where the natural um, transfer of power, which we've become, which we pay more attention to now after the events of the last, uh, you know, two years, um, were, were upended in such a um, kind of traumatic way. Right. Yeah. And, and one of the things when you talk about him being relevant for today that I thought was so interesting, you know, kind, kind of near the start of this time period is um, the Hell's Angel. Uh, Hell's Angels, rather, book that he produced. And one of the things that he said about the Hell's Angels was that you had these um, 
in his words, kind of like prototypical fascist types where these guys are going around the country on motorcycles. They're angry at and kind of rebelling against society uh, in a way. They, uh, they're, they're, they're outcasts and, and that rebellion manifests itself in sometimes poisonous ways. And they are the people who are most affected by this transition to a high-tech economy and being put out of work but also the least equipped to understand it. And so they're kind of raging. Um, do you think on any level that he, part of the reason he understood these people so well is because he identified with them on some level? I mean, he was after all, sort of an angry guy, sort of rebelling against society, sort of an outcast. I'd answer that. That's a very good question. I'd answer it in two ways. Uh, the first would be that Thompson always felt like an outsider in Louisville. Kentucky. Um, he had been, um, he'd gotten in trouble at the end of his senior year of high school and, and the boys that he was with at the time, they, their parents were really powerful figures in Louisville. The families are still powerful today in Louisville, just financially and politically. And they got off, you know, they didn't have to go in front of a judge. They got everything swept away and Thompson didn't have those connections. And he had to go to jail for 30 days. He missed his high school graduation. Um, and he was humiliated and, it, and he saw from as a very young man what power allows people to get away with in different ways and different levels and so i think when it comes to how the how they just felt outside of the game which is what he writes about i think he was writing about that um with some experience i i, I would say though he was equipped to understand it too there was um always something intuitive about him when it came to the larger reason for why something's happening and understanding it. Um, and of course he could shut off his own self-awareness when it, when it benefited him, but he, um, he, he kind of did understand why it was happening. And one of the reasons he left Louisville was because he just didn't feel that he could continue to get a fair shake there. And that's why he was so savage in his depiction of Louisville when he wrote about the town and the Kentucky Derby is decadent and depraved when he returned in <clears throat> 1970. It was, yeah, it was the, when um, Nixon was bombing Cambodia in 1970. You know, and I, I think that in that, I, Hells Angels is, is, a, is a fascinating book because there's the situation, which is that the economy is changing, that a lot of the people that came back from World War II may have been able to have for 20 years, like mechanized jobs within the port of Oakland that, um, allow them to be part of the middle class and suddenly that no longer seemed like a possibility. Um, but then there's their response to it, which is um, the kind of um, mutually assured destruction where if, even if somebody just like says something mean to a hell's angel, they'll all respond together in whatever way they see fit, um, which is just kind of insane, you know? And then I think there's the point that you just brought up how they don't seem to understand that they're being left out of um, society they don't understand why it's happening um and they're just responding with kind of mindless blunt force to to reach out toward and grasp what they you know intuitively sense that they're losing um and i i, I think that book is applicable today too you know when i've gone down to um you re report at cpac um you know even when i've you know the, the interact with the convoy that's um been circling dc you know, I think that's a good way to, to separate it, which is the situation, the response by the people involved, and then their level of awareness of what's going on. Yeah, and, and when you talk about him being able to shut off his self-awareness, there were definitely moments of that. Like One of the mm -hmm. moments in the book that you point to as being kind of a, a Faustian bargain is when he starts taking Dexedrine, I, I think that's how you call it, um, which is ADHD medication. It, it's an amphetamine, correct? Yeah. It okay. is. It was, um, Dexedrine is, it's like Adderall because Adderall was around back then too. It was called Obitrol. Um, it was given as a weight loss, uh, supplement. Um, it but it all has to do with how they're cut with salt. Um, the way that you, um, take it, um, it's like racemic amphetamine, the way that you, it, it's just, it's mixture. Um, so Dexedrine, um, I mean, Joan Didion took Dexedrine. She talks about taking Dexedrine to finish, uh, the author Joan Didion to finish, her first book, um, Slouching Towards Bethlehem, because she's been having my, she had been having migraines. And so she's like, I've taken Dexedrine to try to power through it. I'm writing this now. It was given a lot in the service. Um, and it had kind of um, come back from World War II. 
Um, it had been given to soldiers and it had been given to pilots especially. And um, at the time it was being prescribed to, I mean, it's still prescribed today for ADHD, but um, it was given to hyperactive children in the 60s and more so in the 70s and 80s. But um, it was really kind of more of a broader, um, broadly prescribed drug at that time. Um, he was first introduced to it through his friend, um, um, through a friend in, in Oakland. And so, yeah, he was like the Faustian bargain of, you know, he doesn't want to necessarily take better care of himself. He doesn't want to drink less. He doesn't want to maybe do the work he needs to do <laughs> earlier in terms of research or writing so that he's not overwhelmed at the deadline. He just wants to find a way, um, especially during this 10 year stretch to um, work as hard as he can for, for as long as he can. Um, and it's not just like a deadline, you know, that, that he would kind of experience dextrin in relation to and that kind of Faustian bargain and turning off his awareness or seeing of the cost that's involved in it. Um, but he would um, he'd do it to kind of stay close and be present at these really insane moments um, in retrospect in American history from the Chicago, um, the Chicago uh, Democratic National Convention you know, to covering the Watergate hearings, um, you know, just uh, to following the Hells Angels. Um, and so it is a kind of, um, you know, that idea of whenever something is given, something is also lost, the zero sum equation. Yeah, I, I can imagine in certain scenarios, like when you mentioned pilots being in high pressure, you know, combat, or just needing to stay focused for hours. Um, I, I can imagine how ADHD medication could be useful for that. I can also imagine if you're rolling with the Hells Angels and, and your heart is pounding and, you know, you take some speed basically to sort of uh, center your mind. I, I can see how that would work. Um, but the writing aspect seems difficult because, I, I mean, my impression is that it would just blunt your emotions. Um, and, and I don't feel like that would be great for a writer. I mean, what do you think? Well, I mean, that's a good question too. I, ADHD medication is like a steroid. It works the same on everybody. Um, you know, it's not as if like an antibiotic where if you take it and you don't have an infection, you know, you're not going to feel it in the same way where if you have an infection, you take an antibiotic, you, you get better. It's cured, the infection. You know, it's gone and you notice that difference in, in sensation. With, with um, an ADHD medication like that, one, it depends on the degree or the level or the amount of which he's taking. Um, two, you know, the action is different. Uh, Dexedrine, it has a slower action because um, it's cut with salt um, from my understanding. It's more like Adderall than it is like Benzedrine, which was a much rougher up and down. And then to something like, um, you know, cocaine, you know, um, which is, you know, he would eventually take in his, um, in the, in the 1970s regularly. And so long story short, I, I think that the amount that he was taking, he was always able to write on it in the same way that I think, you know, millions of students that have ADHD and millions more that don't um, may be taking um, ADHD medication. But I always thought of it more of a performance sustainer than a performance enhancer where, you know, it, it can't make you, it can't help you write. It, you may end up writing an eight page email to your parents instead of the paper right. that you need to write. Um, you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't have creativity somehow locked inside of it that you are now, um, you know, releasing by taking it. Um, it. It is more like a steroid where I always remember Barry Bonds, um, you know, he didn't just get that big. And this is a, you know, a baseball reference in the 1990s and 2000s by taking the steroid, he was there working out. It allowed him to work out more. It was basically a workout enhancer that allowed him to, during the toll of a baseball season, um, recover more quickly from working out, put on muscle while also playing 162 games a year. Um, and that's how I think of the way that um, Adderall and Dexedrine for him could work. He was also an alcoholic. So, I mean, he would be drinking while he took it. And that may, you know, alcohol may give you more distance. Um, an ADHD medication, a stimulant, a psychoactive uh, drug like um, Dexedrine makes things closer. Um, you know, but emotionally, I don't think he was taking it to such a degree. And I've talked to people who knew him then, you know, I, I don't, to write the book, I don't think he was taking it to such a degree that 
he didn't really have an emotional response to the world around him or that it really interfered with his writing. I think that that's what happened later with cocaine because of its action. Um, I think you're, it, to put it the way you put it, it did blunt his, pro, his empathy or his relationship to what's important and what's not. And it also, I think, made his mind race so much that it made it harder for him to write the sentences that he wanted. Um, well, when this period from 1963 to 1974, um, drinking whiskey or, or beer or whatever he was, he was always kind of going back and forth between the more distant state and the um, really attuned state. And he was writing a lot, you know, and he had deadlines too, which were helpful to him to get him to produce more. Yeah, it's it's so wild that you have a guy who you know, he, he used to, to copy out a farewell to arms or like Fitzgerald just to get a sense of the rhythms of these writers. And, and clearly, as you mentioned, practicing from the style sheets, et cetera, doing the things that a, a young ambitious writer would do to hone their craft. And yet at the same time, really fucking it up on a lot of levels. Like I, I can't imagine when you, when you say you talk to people who knew him from this time, is there any sense of like, damn it, like if he had, if he had just gotten sober, one, he might still be alive. Uh, and two, who knows what his writing would have become? Yeah, I think that's why his style, that's a good point. I, I talked a lot to his, um, she's wonderful, his editor from Hell's Angels, Margaret Harrell. She just uh, came out with a book called The Hell's Angels Letters, which you should check out. It's um, enormous hardcover a coffee table book that has a lot of Thompson's actual letters that um, he was writing to her. They were going back and forth on the edits and on the composition of the book. Um, and he actually sent her dexedrine in the mail once along with those letters like taped to it. She still has like the orange tablet. Like she never took it taped, yeah. you know, like taped up because um, I don't know, it was some like bullying, half joking way to be like, work harder on my stuff. And also, I, mean, I you know, I, she explains it, I think, but, um, you know, she says, I mean, I'll answer this in two ways. She says that he was producing kind of fantastic work. And I, yeah, I think it's wrong to think that he needed the alcohol to produce that work or the dextrogen to produce that work. You know, I think that's the wrong equation to think. I do think that unlike other writers, his style kind of reached a form and then was later a caricature of that. It didn't become something new. You know, if you look at a writer's career um, who, who has a different relationship with drugs and alcohol um, or um, just with taking care of themselves, you often see the way their prose changes over time. I'm thinking of Philip Roth, you know, I'm even thinking of Joan Didion. I mean, she seems like she's always done the Didion thing, but her novels are very different. Um, you know, you, you see their sentences change. Norman Mailer, you know, and it, it's it's not an either or, but Norman Mailer, who was wild himself, but his style changes so extensively over time. Um, writers I love that are, are uh, poets or nonfiction or fiction writers like Michael and Dodge, um, his style was so different in his early 20s, formally, and also on the level of his sentences. And the, it, that evolves and changes as, as time passes. And for Hunter, it didn't necessarily happen. You know, yeah. and again, other writers that doesn't, but for him, I think part of that is um, he, he burned himself uh, out. You know, he, he did burn too brightly. And I think by the time you know, he, he, he died young, he died, he killed himself at 64. His, his son, um, well, I'm sure you know, Juan Thompson really recounts the, the horror of uh, alcoholism, the toll it took on him at the end of his life um, in a, I think, emotional and fair way. And so, you know, long story short, I do. I, I also think that he was, and this was his argument. Um, I'm not sure what I think about it, but his argument was, this was a rare time in history. You know, if you remember the, the passage, the famous passage from Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, you know, the end of the 60s, the high water mark. But, you know, that sense you could strike sparks anywhere. You know, that, that, the, old, that the forces of old and evil were, uh, you know, being fought against basically this was a historic time to be a journalist and he didn't want to miss out on that. He felt drawn to that. Um, I think the eighties were a great letdown for him in a lot of ways. Um, you know, they just, they didn't really have that um, world changing um, reality of the 1960s and then the, the, the death knell of the sixties, which is the 1970s, the early 1970s. You know, I mean, I didn't even include in this, I, you know, I started the book with Kennedy's assassination, 
but only a, a year before, like we had been on the brink of nuclear war, Thompson had been in um, South America at the time, which is a kind of interesting, he had been writing for um, uh, uh, a weekly news magazine, um, um, dispatches from there. And, um, you know, even that, like the world changing nature of those events. Um, so I do think that the time that he was living through in his opinion um, was something that wasn't about to come around again for a long time. And he wanted to be right at the central nerve as he would say of it. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I'm, I'm curious when, when we talk about a book, like you mentioned fear and loathing in Las Vegas, that right there, it feels, it feels like the guy who wrote that could become like the next Mark Twain, where it, it has almost like a Huck Finn feeling to it of like these two guys, you know, headed out West and they're searching for the American dream. They're fed up with society. It, it, and it's really funny and it's fiction. And it, it's like when you talk about his style becoming a caricature of itself later on, obviously he became quite famous um, with Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail, which we'll talk about. Um, and it became harder for him to be a journalist and be in these moments without being the center of everybody's attention. At that point, it seems like perhaps as a writer, he could have just gone inward and started developing his fiction more. I, I mean, it, it, I, do you see what I'm saying? Like on some level- Yeah, but this... I, I, think, I think he had his, his... I think the alcoholism was destroying him. Yeah. You know, like, I think he was falling apart. I think it was harder to think, you know, I don't, I don't think reality was as clear to him. And there's these sad moments in, I think it's in Juan's book um, where he has people read his work back to him in like the nineties. And he just can't find that rhythm. He can't find those sentences anymore. You know, the most he can do is to kind of remember what it was like to have written them. Um, and I, I don't think that's like, oh, talent's the strange thing that the muse gives to us and takes away. I think he was suffering from terrible late stage effects of alcoholism. Yeah. You know, he had to wear diapers at the end of his life. Um, he was not, it's not just a physical degradation. It was, it was mental degradation too. Yeah, it's crazy he lived that long. Yeah, he was in bad shape. He had broken his leg. You know, he just wasn't, I mean, it's not as if drinking and writing is a new equation. I mean, um, but I, I do think, and I a lot about explored this a lot in Hyper, my first book, um, that we, we do have these myths that we need to kind of break down, either myths about medication or about mental illness um, or about creativity um, or about behavior and this uh, like society in which we live um, that reinforce the way we look at um, people's relationships to medication to drugs to creativity and to um you know and to and, and to their own bodies to, to so that we're kind of always needing to be on the lookout that we're not simply phoning in our definition of what health is and what healthy is you know like that that's it could be so easy to just be like you know oh but he was a great writer so that's what it took was to drink <laughs> and that, that's not true, you know, and that's, and that completely diminishes, uh, you know, the, what his experience was and what the experience of the people who loved him and were, and were around him had to go through. Oh, totally. And, and, and one of the other things that's sort of interesting about Thompson's personality from this book is you have these moments, like when he goes to the democratic national convention, sees all these people get their head beaten in, uh, when he runs for sheriff of Austin on uh, the freak power ticket, and it, it's close, but he loses. And in these moments, he seems really uh, disappointed and disillusioned, which is interesting to me because I've talked to I talked to like Bill Ayers on this podcast at one point, and he said, you know, he was horrified by what happened at the convention, but he was not surprised or disillusioned by it. He sort of expected that. Um, does it, it feels almost like Hunter was kind of like a, an idealist wrapped in a, a cynic's clothing. Um, yeah, where do you think, I think that comes that's a good from? Point. You know, I think that he had a sort of romantic sense of power being held accountable. Um, and I, I, I would say that's interesting, like um, an idealist wrapped in a, an aesthetic's clothing. I think both 
factors were always at play. Here's one, one, one aspect of Hunter Thompson's personality I've talked to, talked about with people that knew him. Um, and I, and I found intriguing was that he was pretty much wrong about everything. And he, he was really good at it. The only thing he was ever right about was Nixon. Um, besides that, you know, he thought, and, he, and, and what's more is he writes about that. So he writes about disappointment and disillusionment. He arrives at the cynical perspective after hoping, you know, after, after believing that something might go a different way. Um, in the 60s, where that kind of battering ram of disillusionment <laughs> breaking through, you know, with Robert Kennedy's death, um, like he had written to the Kennedy campaign, Bobby Kennedy's 1968 presidential campaign, a month before Kennedy was killed, offering to help as a speechwriter. Um, you know, saying that that's my skill, I'd love to help him any way I can. Like he was an idealist like that. Um, he was an idealist politically. I think it changed later in the 70s with his disappointment with Jimmy Carter and then with the 80s and it's just kind of emptiness. But he was, uh, he believed that change could happen within the system. He didn't have to burn the system down to make things better. Um, he believed that the democratic mechanisms that existed at the time could be molded and used for justice, to hold people accountable, to improve the lives of people. And he was constantly being disappointed <laughs> by, by the failures of the system and also by kind of that other larger force that, you know, is, is one of destruction or undoing, you know, just that it's, it takes a whole lifetime to arrive where Bobby Kennedy did you know, at the perspective of really trying to work within the system. I think his beliefs are similar to Thompson's, you know, to try to make things better. And in one minute, just a, a, a schizophrenic assassin can um, take all that away. There's it's so much easier to undo it, you know, than to build it up. Um, and I, I was always fascinated. And again, like I see your earlier question of where the story came from, the dynamic between Hunter Thompson and Oscar Zeta Acosta, who would kind of be caricatured in Fear and Loathing, um, but who was a um, fascinating civil rights attorney, but who really believed you had to blow the system up. You know, he, and he was really willing, he was willing to do it. Um, and he was doomed in that sense too. And so their, their struggles over, their arguments over whether to work within the system, whether to be idealistic, or whether you, you've arrived at such a point as the system, it's time to start blowing up government buildings. Um, I found fascinating. And I, I, I think that tension maybe in those 10 years is most acute for Thompson, that tension between the idealists and the cynic. Yeah, and, and you say how after Nixon left and into the, the late 70s and 80s, um, he sort of, I don't know if sputtered out is the right term, but it, it feels like as a writer, maybe partly as a, a person, the center of gravity sort of went out of balance. Uh, why yeah. do you think that is? Like, was Nixon this force he needed to sort of rejigger himself? You no, know, I, that's a good question. I, I think we're back at that, that issue of how much of it was physical for Thompson. He was doing cocaine. Right. He had been an alcoholic by then for 30 years. You know, he'd been drinking every day since he was all day, since he was 16 years old, basically, um, in different degrees. And um, is that, is that true? And like known that he was drinking every day, all day, basically? Since yeah, he but it was a beer, you know, well, well, this is, I'm sure there were times when he was in the army, when he had responsibilities when he was younger, but by the time he was 24, 25, um, you know, even when he had a small child, he still had that schedule of writing at night. And so his day was set up that it was, he'd wake up at 1 p.m., you know, 2 p.m., 3 p.m., 4 p.m., and he would just have a cocktail. And so he wasn't drunk. I mean, this is the sense I get, is that, I, I the, you know, Joe Rogan read a, um, list of Hunter Thompson's diet that E. Jean Carroll, who's a great writer, published in her biography of him in the um, early 90s. I, I don't, I mean, maybe that's where he arrived by 1992, but I don't think that's what he was doing in his 20s, but I, he'd wake up and he'd have a beer. You know, I mean, he was an alcoholic. He was dependent on it. I, I don't think he'd feel well until he started to have that beer. Um, and I don't think he was raging drunk then, you know, but as the day progressed and the day went on, he would, um, you know, drink more. And so that is, that is known. I mean, his, his first wife, Sandy says, you know, he had a drink every day, basically, since he was 15. And that by the time he was in his early 20s and a professional and could kind of make his own schedule, you know, he was drinking um, from when he woke up to when he went to bed, but in this kind of paced out way. And so he was always, Thompson was always really disdainful of people, um, like within the uh, Ken Kesey camp, that would be so out of control, 
drunk or on drugs, you know, like on hallucinogens. You know, Thompson was um, always, always sure during, especially during these years that if something went down, he was still on his toes. Um, so he wasn't like blacked out drunk. He wasn't out of control in that sense. And again, that's that mixture of dextrine too, which made him more alert, you know? And so he could have a beer, have a few beers, have beers for 12 hours, you know, have 14 beers over 14 hours. I'm not, I don't know, but like he could do that and still function. And he found it really distasteful when people were just like zombies or conked out. Because I think part of his idealism too is he believed it's the writer's job to be, you know, on the lookout and recording and, and ready for the world around them and its experiences to um, turn those experiences in the world into story or into narrative. Yeah, and, and I, I just gotta say, you mentioned uh, Rogan in there, and obviously you you went on the guy's uh, show, and I, I saw uh, your Slate article about your appearance on it, and so sort of in preparation for this, I, I watched it, and, and I, I have to say, you you were a little hard on yourself in that article, man. Like, I, it was a good fucking podcast. Like, I enjoyed it. You know, it was it was entertaining. It's a good subject. You had things to say. Like, w w what was that experience like? No, I, that's a good question. I, 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 I like writing because writing allows you to control the pace of the reader's experience. And so I, that's how I like to communicate with readers. I mean, I, in the moment, felt like, I felt like I was talking, so I had just been on a book tour. I felt like I was talking to a liberal audience that wasn't there, that I was like, well, Thompson's a, a, a white man from the 60s, but he has a lot to say about democracy. And Joe Rogan just wanted to talk about him. He just wanted, he wanted to have a friendly conversation. There was something so genuine about his excitement. And I wasn't quite seeing that. It was as if I was having a conversation in another way. And, and I, I appreciate that. Like, it was a fine, it, I, I think it went well, but so the essay in Salon that I wrote was a lot about um, Salon, the sorry. nervousness. No, it's the nervousness I felt. You know, I just was, um, I, and how things speed up. And that's for me how ADHD tends to work, you know, being overwhelmed in that sense. Um, and I, um, you know, and then there's also just like, the, I mean, I got anybody that goes on there gets death threats for whatever I'm sure they said or they're doing, but you know, like that exposed to a troll community afterwards. Um, but I do think too, part of what strikes me now about listening to that interview from 2019 is how focused I was on Donald Trump and bringing everything back to Donald Trump as if I, and it had a set of talking points. And I only bring that up to say that it's amazing how much that politics in our world was dominated even only three years ago by um, a singular uh, figure. And I, you know, so going, going on, on Rogan's show, I, um, and I had done a lot of publicity for the book, you know, on a book tour, but I, I guess I, I regretted not, um, I regretted not going into it one, having just done the goddamn research by listening to a bunch more of Rogan's podcasts, right. um, you know, and two, um, I, I wish I would have taken him at face value in front of me more um, instead of imagining there's such a big audience out there or, you know, talking the way I talked on my book tour, you know, when I'm out of university, you know, with members of the gender studies department and with my English department colleagues, you know, and I, I we're just talking about different issues. Um, and, and I, and, and he wasn't like that. And so in the essay, like, I think that he gets a lot of flack for not following up when people make certain comments, you know, or putting pressure on him. But I, I, I do think that's one of the strengths. And I experienced it because I had not wanted to say when I was on the show that I had ADHD. So it's basically as if I, which I do, you know, and I have been treated for it, you know, medically for much of my life. Um, and I, and I just didn't want to say it. And I didn't want to admit that. And he, I thought was generous in not following up on that. Cause basically if I'm saying I'm taking Adderall, but I don't have ADHD or a prescription, I, I'm saying I'm taking it illegally. Right. And yeah. that's of course not the case. And I had written about it, but he could have really pressed there, you know? Um, and then he was just genuine, genuine and generous. And he really, you know, does love Thompson's work. I mean, I, I teach writers, you know, I, I teach brilliant MFA students. I think they're great, but I see a lot of writers today that don't read. They don't really, read. You know, and it's just like, I mean, that's what I like about Rogan too, is he's read everything. I mean, I'm not here to you know, condone his behavior or to excuse it or to, you know, really say anything else that one, I think that he does have a genuine skill and two, he's read everything Thompson's written. You know, he's a genuine fan of Hunter Thompson. Um, 
And I, you know, I, people say, like, I want to write a novel on this. I've started it. like, oh, well, what novels have you read that are like it, that you love, that are kind of a blueprint for how you would do it? And they go, I don't read novels. <laughs> like, why do you want to write a novel? If you don't read novels. You know, it's like, I, it, it kind of blows my mind. Um, and so, um, you know, that's, a, that's another thing too, is that um, Thompson, there, there's something so musical to his prose, to his perspective. It's, it's a lot for me, similar to um, George Orwell's work, even though they're vastly different stylistically. Orwell really feels like he's like an old Russian novelist, like reaching his arm out around you to say, hey, there was a time in uh, Burma when I was working as a magistrate, when I was hated by more people <laughs> than I would ever be. Um, when you shooting an elephant by George Orwell, there's such an intimacy to that writing you know, where Orwell's just talking to you directly that I feel is present in Thompson's work in his best work. Um, and I, I've always been attracted to that. And it was nice to talk to Rogan because I could see he was genuinely attracted to that. He genuinely enjoyed that too. And that's why I like talking to Thompson fans who really know his work. Um, and, you know, and I haven't just dressed up like him on, on, um, on things, you know, on, on Halloween. Like, I, I think if you, you've probably already done it, but people who are fans of Thompson, they should check out his letters oh, yeah. too. You know, his collection of letters, they're, they're just fascinating. His letters his are voice, wild. <laughs> yeah, they're great because he was relaxed. And so his voice was coming through as a writer. You know, so they're, they're really great. Um, they're more engaging than a lot of his early journalism. You know, that's more straightforward because you, you hear him talking to whoever that is that he knows on the other end, which his best writing, I think, feels like when it's, you know, um, w when you're reading it um, as an audience. It's fascinating to me that you say that your MFA students don't read novels, and this is something that they, they do. They do. That, that's that, that's not fair. They, they're good, but I think that they. But I think that a lot of writers. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I. I they, they do read. They're very good, but I do think people, maybe some of the, a few of them don't, and I do think I, I meet people all the time that want to be writers, and that exactly like what you're talking about, and don't read novels. Or they want to do a nonfiction book, but they, they've never read a nonfiction book made like that. I mean, like, have you read John McPhee? You know, have you read Didion's political work? And they're like, no, I haven't. You know, they, it, I don't know if it's a, just basically a cinematic narrative that they have in their mind, you know, but they think it should come out in prose. Right. But um, it, 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 it's mind blowing to me. And I think it is harder to read in 2022 with all the distractions that we have than it was in 1962, you know, or 1963. Oh, yeah. well, but. But why? Yeah. So it is. It, it blows my mind, too. It, it's I mean, part of this feels, though, like and, and this is not directly related to Hunter Thompson, I guess, but it's something I'm curious about and, and something I've sort of been uh, been nagging at me is the fact that if you're if you were told, for instance, that there was some great work of art that was produced today in the year 2022 and it just captured the zeitgeist and you were asked what medium that work of art was made in like probably like one of the last on the list would be a novel or, or like maybe last would be poetry or something. And it seems as though if you're an artist, you have to engage with the world on some level, like certainly Hunter Thompson engaged with the world and his work still resonates much for that reason. Um, and you have to respond to the zeitgeist and in some ways perhaps even shape it. And yet the novel is just not suited for that. It has like clearly, at, at least my view as a young person, uh, you're, you're closer to my age than I guess to Rogan's. Um, so I, I imagine you feel on some level that perhaps the novel, the, the future of it has to involve technology on some level. Is, is this? Well, that's funny. You know, I, I think that the book, I mean, I'll answer that in a few ways. I think that the book is a technology that lasts. And so I remember talking to James Salter, who's a novelist, um, a friend of Thompson's that lived in Aspen um, in like 2015, 2014. And he was like, you know, he had a lot of great writers that he you know, was with and he knew, and he had gone to Hollywood to be a screenwriter and had made a lot of money writing scripts that were bought, but didn't get made into movies. You know, he made Downhill Racer, which was, um, famous movie in the 1960s, but a lot of them were just bought for a lot of money, but nobody ever saw them. And he said, it has, it can't just be in magazines and it can't just be bought. It has to be in books. There's something about books. And again, this is the past, but that are on a shelf that people will discover and find. And writing is a technology too, where you can communicate 
to people that are long with people that are long since dead, but suddenly see their perspective, see their arguments, hear their stories. Um, I think that books will like continue to last. I think books will continue to be important, not just because there'll be a nuclear war and there'll be the only thing left, but I, I do think that there'll always be a medium um, that we're comfortable um, engaging. I, I think that cinema has long supplanted the novel as the way to best capture the zeitgeist. And so I think what you're talking about is what will then supplant cinema you know, as a way to capture Perhaps. the experience. But I think there will still be novels and books of poetry will still come through um, that really articulate the time. And you know, I'm a firm believer in, in nonfiction as a creative form that will um, capture time and place. Um, and there's something sturdy about the technology of a book, of a printed book. You know, I think they will bring stories, bring voices into the upcoming centuries in a way that's hard for us to understand now, just because they won't degrade in the way a CD does. And they have a physical permanence to them. I think there'll always be somebody in a room in a cabin, you know, or in an apartment. Um, and they may be reading on an e-reader, you know, they may be connecting to the internet with their mind, I, but there'll also be that space for that kind of analog um, experience of flipping pages. Um, and I, I do think that I, for me, I do think about how cinema in the post-war world really challenged and I, I think replaced the novel's um, prime position as the best way to express the zeitgeist. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Although at the same time, you know, writing is a technology, yes, but it's been around for, I guess, tens of thousands of years, whereas the novel itself has only been around for almost like, like a little bit over 400 years, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that was, but, but epic poetry is, I mean, you're right, but epic yeah. poetry, I mean, I, I read the Aeneid today. I love, I, lo I read it in Latin, you know, like I was a Latin classics minor, <clears throat> which nobody is, I think anymore, but, um, you know, I read it in Latin and I mean, I love Catullus's poetry about being pissed off at his like lover, at his like lover's lovers, you know, in like Rome in the first century. I think there's such a real human emotion to that. And, and you're right. We're talking about the novel as, as a form. Um, but I, I think that, you know, the form of the Iliad, um, I think the, the, the form of Seneca's letters, you know, um, the form of, um, you know, um, Shea Shonagon's like uh, pillow book, like those are still a deeply human expressions that haven't, that the novel carry, that I'm sorry, that writing carried forward, the form of the book carried, for, carried forward, um, you know, elegantly into this, into this moment. Um, and I, you know, I, I have no idea how it's going to go, but I, I think that there's something about the use of language, um, as, um, a technology that captures what has happened. Um, that is so essential that actually gives the book, um, as a form, um, a, a leg up on some of these other technologies and collaborative modes of expression too. Or a book is a collaboration when it finally gets published like in 2022, but you know, um, I, I think, and it's a collaboration in that, think of all the, you know, monks um, in medieval um, castles that had to be transcribing before the printing press, right. these works from the classics on. Um, so I, 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 I think, I mean, I grew up in San Jose, I grew up in Silicon Valley. I, I, I don't know how or in what manner change will come, but I think there'll always be a place for recording this world in language, you know, in writing. Um, at least I, I would hope that. so. I, yeah. I agree with I do, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm just curious yeah. when you mentioned the printing press. I mean, we do all now technically have a printing press in our pocket. So you, you would yeah. think there'd be new forms. You'd think there would be, you know? Yeah, well, new forms, what do you mean? Like new forms of, of like, like the novel is a new form or new forms like a VR movie? Uh, no, not a VR movie. Actually, if you got 60 <laughs> seconds at the end of this call, I'm, I'm, I'd love to tell you about something I'm working on right now. Um, okay. But we're almost at 45 minutes here. So I, I just want to round this yeah. off with, with something about Hunter Thompson. Um, yeah, that sounds great. Is he, is he taken seriously in, in sort of the quote unquote literary world? I, I know you have guys like Henry Miller or like Charles Bukowski who maybe are like Hunter Thompson adjacent on some level. Um, and yet they don't seem to be to be taken super seriously. Um, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I think that he is. I mean, I think I've, I was obviously writing with a bit of a chip on my shoulder because of the caricatured nature of Thompson 
over the last 20 years. Um, I do think he has taken seriously um, within nonfiction, especially within the field of new journalism. Um, you know, uh, Ted Conover is a great writer uh, who I had a chance to talk to last year. He went undercover at Sing Sing prison as he learned to be a prison guard, became a prison guard, went there, was a prison guard, all for the purpose of writing about it. Um, you know, he, he's a Thompson fan in terms of the act of research, I think, the immersion that Thompson did. I also think, speaking of new forms, nonfiction has moved more towards hybridity in the 21st century. We see the lyric essay, which is often experimental form, um, is more towards poetry, leaning in its form. Um, and then we see kind of auto fiction and um, these, these different boxes of truth that are coming out, um, both within just the straight literary fiction world, but also within the nonfiction world. And I think Thompson's hybridity, where he'd have personal stories, he'd have found pieces of art, you know, he'd have lists, he'd have, um, you know, all of these different kind of um, collage based uh, pieces that would come together for, uh, to, to create his reportage um, or to create the essay that would go on Rolling Stone. Um, I think that that's valued also. You know, I think, his politics are, are complicated, um, you know, and I think a lot of the conversation around the 50th anniversary was, you know, about Oscar Costa's role. Uh, there was a New Yorker article about it um, in creating um, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Um, and I think that's that's fair. Uh, Philip Rodriguez, um, um, or about Oscar Costa, Philip Rodriguez was, is, a, is a great filmmaker in LA and he he's featured in that article in the New Yorker. He's talking about, how Costa deserves more credit. So I think there's a reevaluation of maybe some of his work in that sense, but it was still, um, in terms of its subject matter, holding the most powerful people accountable. And in terms of its form, um, how he put these essays together, how he used personal narrative versus more um, observed narrative, um, you know, versus analysis. Um, I think it's regarded as, as literary. Excellent. On that note, uh, the book is Free Kingdom, Hunter S. Thompson's Manic Ten-Year Crusade Against American Fascism. Timothy, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Duncan. It's been really nice to talk with you.